Hello friends, this video on evolution part 14 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So now we will talk about a very important principle regarding evolution and this is called Hardy-Weinberg principle. So let us see what is Hardy-Weinberg principle. Now even before we talk about the principle, we actually need to see where this principle plays a role. So who was Hardy and who was Weinberg? So let us try to see from where this, intro, this principle actually came into existence and then we will see what this principle talks about. Now, as I had mentioned before that Charles Darwin went on a voyage around 1836 and during this voyage, he came up with the concept of uh, evolution. He gave the concept of natural selection. However, he did not have any idea of genetics. In fact, he was one of them who did not support Mendel's work on genetics. However, Mendel came after Charles Darwin. So anyways, he did not have much idea on genetics. So as per Darwin, he believed that the offsprings which were being produced, they were a result of blending. That means some traits from the father and some traits from the mother, they mixed up together and the blending resulted in the formation of offsprings. But later, after a couple of years, Gregor Mendel performed a series of experiments on the pea plant. And he gave the rules of inheritance, which we have discussed in one of our previous lessons. But unfortunately, people did not believe the rules which were given by Mendel. Why? Because first of all, because whatever rules Mendel gave, they were all experiment based and they were all based on the statistics. So people could not relate biology with mathematics and they did not give any importance to the rules given by Mendel's experiments. But Mendel introduced the concept of factors which we call now as genes and he said that there is no blending taking place actually but the, these factors are carrying the traits from one generation to another generation as it is and that is why the offsprings resemble their parents. But it was just Mendel's misfortune that nobody supported him much. But quite some time later, somewhere around now, Mendel performed all this experiment around 1865 and Charles Darwin's voyage was around 1836. But quite some time later, somewhere around 1900s, again, the some of the scientists rediscovered Mendel's work and they said that, yes, whatever rules Mendel had given, they were all true. So now then there came another scientist called Punnett. Yes, after whose name the Punnett square has been named. So he also did a lot of uh, research trying to understand the fact that why recessive traits exist over time. Now it was being proved that okay Mendel's work was correct and whatever laws he gave they were all correct. But the question that arose in the scientist's mind that okay we got to know that there is something called dominant trait, there is something called recessive trait. So the dominant trait always uh, dominates the recessive trait and therefore it gets expressed. But the question was when the recessive trait is not the dominant trait, so why does it even exist? Why doesn't it disappear with time? But it still exists. So in fact we see that in the first generation the recessive trait remain hidden but in the next generation it reappears. So why is it that the recessive traits exist over time? So Panet was work trying to find out the solution to this when he approached another mathematician and this mathematician was Hardy. So that is where Hardy's role came into picture. So Hardy worked on the mathematics behind genetics and while working on these mathematics behind genetics he gave this principle which was that time known as the Hardy's principle. But later there was another scientist Weinberg who also gave the same principles but in a modified way in a better way and that is why the principle came to be known as Hardy-Weinberg principle. Now however upon even after this there were many other scientists who worked on who worked further on genetics and they came up with the chromosomal basis of inheritance and etc. So there we have the Bovary Sutton theory and after that came the Morgan's experiment and so on. But meanwhile, I mean it was in connection with Punnett because Punnett and Hardy they were good friends. 
so they were like connected to each other they were good friends and hardy was a mathematician now since he was a mathematician he had good knowledge on numbers and as we all know now that genetics had a lot to do with mathematics so genetics has a lot to do with statistics so hardy actually helped panet in trying to understand why recessive traits exist over time and if you look at the concept of panet square you get to see that in panet square we actually don't do much we just try to find out the factors or we try to find out the gametes and then just try to look at all the combinations possible and with that we can actually uh, determine what is going to be the probability of having what kind of offspring in the next generation so this work was possible only with the help of this mathematician hardy so hardy gave this principle somewhere around 1908 but it was you can say it was it was something which happened for good but however there was another scientist around 1943 quite some time later he also came up with the same law which or the same principle which hardy had given but he gave it in a better way and in a more modified way and that is why the principle came to be known as hardy weinberg principle now many people think that mostly it happens that whenever a principle or an experiment is named after two scientists it generally happens that both of them work together to prove that thing but that that didn't happen for hardy and weinberg they both worked uh, separately in two different time zones i mean somebody worked around 1908 somebody worked around 1943 but since both of them proved the same thing so that is why the principle came to be known as hardy weinberg principle so now we will see hardy weinberg principle but before that we'll have to have a quick recap of a few small things so the first thing that we will take as a part of recap is allele so we all know by now what is allele because we have studied the entire genetics but still we will have a quick recap so what are alleles alleles are nothing but slightly different forms of the same gene for example if we talk about hair color so hair color can be brown hair color can be black so brown and black are two different forms of the same gene right so the these alleles they code for a pair of contrasting traits so that is what we say contrasting traits means the color can be brown the color can be black so basically they are contrasting with each other an organism inherits two alleles for each gene so one allelic pair forms a gene so one gene will have two alleles so one allele will come from the father the other allele will come from the mother so let us take let us try to look at where the alleles are located so if you take these two chromosomes these are two homologous chromosomes so let us suppose this blue lines which you see here this represent the gene which represent say blue hair color so the same set of gene will be present on this chromosome as well which might say black so black might say the black hair color right so the two alleles will always be located on the same position of the homologous chromosome it is just that their forms can be different it is not necessary that both of them have to represent the blue eye color one can be blue one can can be black so let us take example we will use the example of the mendel's pea plant so that it will be easier for you also so now if if we talk about all these plants so this is a tall plant so how do we write the genotype of this we say this can be tt so each t is an allele so each t here represent an allele that means this plant has inherited a capital t from one parent and a capital t from another parent and that is why it is tt and these two alleles together this allelic pair forms a gene similarly this tall plant can be capital t small t that means it has inherited one allele which is capital t from father and one allele which is small t from mother and that is why it is capital t small t so these two are the alleles similarly this can also be capital t small t this can be small t small t which means both the alleles are small t here both alleles are for dwarf dwarf plant and that is why the entire plant is dwarf so you know what are alleles so these are all examples of alleles so here each member of a gene is an allele and one pair of alleles form a gene so each t or t is an allele 
So by now we all know what is a phenotype and what is a genotype but still let us have a quick recap. Phenotype is something which is observable. So something which is being displayed, something which you can see. So those kind of properties are called phenotype. For example, if you talk about a plant, if we say that the plant is tall or the plant is dwarf, so that tallness or dwarfness is something which is visible, visible which is observable. So they are the phenotypes of the plant. But when you say genotype, we talk about the genetic genetic makeup of that organism or genetic information of that organism. So how do we denote phenotype and genotype? Let us suppose if this, these are the two plants. So if you talk about its phenotype, it would be tall and this would be dwarf because that is what can be seen. But when you talk about the genotype, for a dwarf plant, the genotype would be small t, small t. For a, cap, for a tall plant, the genotype can be capital T, capital T. It can also be capital T, small t. Because capital T is, a dominant, is dominant over small t. So if it is a heterozygous, that means if capital T and small t are present together, capital T will get expressed and small t will remain hidden. So the genotype for a tall plant could be either capital T, small t or capital T, capital T. So the examples of phenotype are tall, dwarf, round, wrinkled. So if you talk about the seed shape, their phenotypes could be round, it could be wrinkled. If you talk about seed color, it could be green, yellow. So they are all phenotypes. Genotypes are something of the sort. This is how you denote them. So the genotype is actually going to tell you what sort of alleles that particular organism has inherited from its parents. So that information is actually given by the genotype. So here you can see round seed and wrinkled seed. So this is a round seed. So here genotype would say it as capital R, capital R. That could also be, that could be a round seed. Here it is wrinkled seed, so it will be small r, small r. But a round seed can also be capital R, small r. Now, when we talk about genotypes, it becomes important to talk about homozygous and heterozygous. So, as I was telling, if in a genotype, if both the alleles are identical, that is, if both the alleles are same, then it is a homozygous genotype. So, homo means, the word homo itself means same or uniform. So, if both the alleles are identical, it is homozygous and if they are different, then it is heterozygous. So, I am sure you know the examples like capital T, capital T is homozygous, small d, small d again homozygous. So, these are all homozygous whereas these are heterozygous. Now, even if the genotype is homozygous, it can be, uh, it, I hope any genotype can be either homozygous or heterozygous but still it can have the same phenotype. For example, a tall plant can be capital T, capital T, it can also be capital T, small t. So you see in one case the genotype is homozygous and in another case the genotype is heterozygous. But in both the cases, what is the phenotype? The phenotype is tall. So phenotype is the same even though the genotype can be heterozygous or it can be homozygous. So that is what we were discussing just now. What would be the phenotype for genotype capital T small t? So in this case the concept of dominant and recessive trait comes into picture. So now in this type of genotype capital T is dominant over small t. Now since capital T is dominant so capital T will get expressed and small t will remain hidden. So therefore the phenotype would be tall. So capital T small t is going to be a tall plant. So this tall plant is going to be capital T small t and a plant is going to be a dwarf only when both the alleles are for dwarf. So a dwarf, a recessive trait gets expressed only in the homozygous condition. So this is homozygous recessive. This is homozygous recessive and this is heterozygous condition. So these were some of the basic recap of genetics because we will be using these terms when we talk about the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com for an easy four-step learning process absolutely free of cost. Watch video lessons, ask questions, refer notes and take an online test. Thank you once again.